Hello, I'm Doug Lane, senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and I want to welcome you to The Vine, our online campus where we worship each and every week through the miracle of iPhones and computers and all kinds of different uh, technological equipment. So I'm glad that you're able to log on today and to be able to worship with us. Today we're going to be focusing on why do you need to be part of a church? Can't you just do Christianity by yourself? Well, Pastor Julia is going to help us answer that question a little later on in our service. But thanks so much for taking time out of your busy day and your busy schedule to be a part of our worshiping community today. I invite you to pray with me. O God, in mystery and in silence, you are present in our lives, bringing new life out of destruction, hope out of despair, growth out of difficulty. We thank you that you do not leave us alone, but instead labor to make us whole. Help us to perceive your unseen hand in the unfolding of our lives and to attend to the gentle guidance of your spirit so that we may know the joy you give your people. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to join with me now as we affirm our faith using the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
Good morning, I'm Matt Carson of the Confirmation Class, and today's reading will be from Psalm 16. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, You are my Lord, apart from you I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, They are the new ones, in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods, or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my life secure. The boundary line has fallen for me in tons of places. Surely I, will, surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me to keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. As a fire is meant for burning with a bright and warming flame, so the church is meant for mission, giving glory to God's name. Not to preach our creeds or customs, but to build a bridge of care. We join hands across the nation, finding neighbors everywhere. We are learners, we are teachers, we are pilgrims on the way. We are seekers, we are givers, we are vessels made of clay. By our gentle, loving actions, we would show that Christ is life. In an humble, listening spirit, we would live to God's delight. As a green bud in the springtime is a sign of life renewed, so may we be signs of oneness in earth's people's many hue. As a rainbow lights the heavens when a storm is past and gone, may our lives reflect the radiance of God's new and glorious dawn. We come now to the time in our service when we have the great privilege of going to God in prayer. As I lead us in prayer, I will pause during the prayer to give you the opportunity to speak the names of individuals that you would like to remember in prayer today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we live in a world where the security we once seemed to enjoy has been eroded away and so many dark clouds of unknowing seem to be looming on the future's unpredictable horizon. All that seemed to be so secure and reliable has turned to sawdust in our hands and evaporated like the morning mist. But Lord, we praise your name that we can entrust our future into your safekeeping knowing that your love surrounds us and that your grace is sufficient, no matter how dark the circumstances of life may appear. Thank you, Lord, that you hold the world in the palm of your hand. As we gather to worship you, O oh Lord, we bring our cares and concerns, and we especially lift up to you in prayer these whose names we now speak. Hear our prayers, O Lord. And as Jesus taught His disciples to pray, so now we also pray together using the same words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Part of what we do as a church is to encourage Christians to give as an act of worship. One responsibility of the church, of course, is to receive those gifts and offerings and use them to advance the kingdom of God. For example, our theme for this year, 2022, is more than Sunday mornings. And as part of that theme, we're offering several Bible studies in this new year that will meet at various times during the week. Uh, many of them will also offer Zoom options. So if you're not in the local area or it's not convenient for you to actually be here at the church, you can still participate. Uh, we also have new young adult ministry being formed. These and many other discipleship opportunities during the week are made possible through your worship of God by giving. We worship God by giving back to God out of the abundant blessings that God has given us. We give out of gratitude for what God has already done for us. And we give to invest in the kingdom of God. So as we reflect on our giving and our worship of God through giving, let's help our church to be more than Sunday morning as we invest in God's kingdom as an act of worship. You may worship God with giving uh, today through our uh, website or through our cell phone app or through the U.S. mail. Let us pray. We offer to you, O oh God, the gift of our hands and the loyalty of our hearts. Accept us with our gifts and offerings. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
So it's time for the children's message. I'm Pastor David, one of the associate pastors here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and it's my joy to be able to share the children's message today. So if you have children or youth nearby who aren't already watching the video, now's a great time to call them over. So I've got some things to share with them today. So today we're thinking about church. You know, we put a lot of emphasis on going to church, on joining the church, uh, worshiping either at church or with our video worship service like, like you're doing. And in fact, uh, right now there, there are 16 youth going through confirmation classes in preparation for joining the church. In March, we're going to have a new member class for adults who wish to join the church. So we put a lot of emphasis on church here at church. Now, we know that the church is more than a building. When I was a child, we used to do this little thing with our hands where we said, this is the church and there's the steeple. Open the doors and see all the people. And that's really a good uh, way to think about church because church is the people. It's not just a building. Now, why is church so important? Well, I want you to think about it this way. The church is like a turkey sandwich, for example. And by the way, turkey sandwich is my personal favorite sandwich. So if I want a turkey sandwich, there are certain things that I need. I'm going to need some bread. I'll need some turkey. I'll need some cheese, Swiss cheese, because it, this is church and Swiss cheese is holy. And most important of all, Miracle Whip. Yeah, no mustard, no plain mayonnaise. It's got to be Miracle Whip for me because that makes the best sandwich. So um, now, how is the church like a turkey sandwich? Well, let me just uh, spread a little Miracle Whip here. And uh, we're going to put our cheese on and we're going to put our turkey on. Okay. So how is church like this turkey sandwich? Well, God wants to accomplish certain things in the world. And in order to do that, God decided a long time ago to gather people together who believe in Jesus and gather them into the church. Now, like a turkey sandwich, we're not all the same. Uh, you know, the bread is not the same as the cheese. Uh, the turkey is certainly not the same as the Miracle Whip, and the Miracle Whip is really one of the best parts, at least in, in my mind. And it's the same way in the church. You know, we're all different. We're different people. We have uh, different talents. We have different skills. We have different abilities in the church. But God has a special purpose for each of us. And the church needs all of us to be a part of it to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. Now, in the same way, if I want a turkey sandwich, I need these special ingredients. Uh, what if I don't have turkey? How can you have a turkey sandwich without turkey? Uh, what if I didn't have cheese? Well, something would be missing for sure. If I didn't have bread, well, I guess I could put the Miracle Whip and the turkey in the cheese and squirt some uh, Miracle Whip on it. Uh, what if I don't have Miracle Whip? I'm not sure I could make a turkey sandwich without that that would satisfy my hunger. Well, in the same way, each of us is an important ingredient in the church. God wants you to be a part of the church so the church can successfully fulfill the church's mission. The church needs each of you just like 
A turkey sandwich needs each of these basic ingredients. And when we're all active in our church, and you're using your talents and gifts for God, then the church is the church that God wants the church to be. Just like when you have all the ingredients for the turkey sandwich, then the turkey sandwich is what it should be. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the children and youth that are watching this video today, the children and youth in our church and community and, and all of their families. We pray your blessings on them. Help each of us to find our place in your church, that the church will be the church that you want it to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm Pastor Julia Crone, one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to get to bring our message this morning. Our message is going to focus on this really interesting question, why bother with church? Why should I be involved in church or go to church or participate in online worship in the midst of this crazy world? So we're going to have some, some fun getting into that, um, and we're going to begin with our scripture passage. This is Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1 and reading through verse 16. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Join me in prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was 15 years old, I got saved. Well, at least that is what I was told had happened. I was at a summer camp and had just responded to what I now know could be called an altar call. I had been invited to accept Jesus Christ as my savior to get on board with the work that God was doing in my life. And I remember that in the midst of this moment that would become a turning point in my life, I was crying and an adult chaperone was holding me and hugging me. And she said to me, you're good now. 
If you walked outside and got hit by a car, you would go to heaven. You're done. In her mind, these were really wonderful and exciting words. In my mind, they were kind of confusing. For the first, I hadn't been all that concerned about heaven to begin with. I was baptized in the church. I went to church every Sunday. This was more of me realizing I wanted a personal relationship with Jesus. I now understand that this is a particular type of Christianity in which some people think that the main thing we need to do is accept Jesus into our hearts and then we can go to heaven. From that perspective, the answer to the question, why bother being part of the church, might be, eh, take it or leave it. It really isn't all that important. You see, if the main point of Christianity is confessing Jesus so you can go to heaven, then, as that well-meaning woman said to me after I accepted God's love for myself, you're done. In the United Methodist Church, however, we believe that salvation is so much more than one moment. When I say salvation, I'm not just talking about what happens when we die. We're sure, of course, that our eternal future is held safely in God's hands, simply because of who God is and the work that Jesus Christ has done for us. We believe that through the work of Jesus Christ, we have been forgiven and set right with God. We call this justification. But we also believe that we're called to be reshaped in Jesus' likeness in the here and now. We call this sanctification. Sanctification means becoming holy. I know, we don't really like to talk about holiness now. When we hear the word, we might start thinking about holier than thou, or we think of exclusive societies with strict rules about who is pure enough to earn membership. But I really don't think that that is what holiness means to God. And I know that it's not what it means in the Methodist tradition. When we talk about pursuing holiness, we're talking about being made whole. Holiness means holiness, wholeness. Sanctification is the process of being restored to wholeness through the grace of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Being part of the church is more about sanctification than it is about justification. We participate not to check off a box to make sure that God keeps loving us, but in order to respond to God's love that is always calling us into deeper relationship and obedience. And we participate not to make sure that we go to heaven when we die, but so that we can start living like citizens of heaven now. And to do that, we need to train. Recently, I've been watching the Netflix docu-series called Cheer. Has anyone else seen it? The show follows a college cheerleading team at, te at a Texas school called Navarro College. They're fighting for a national championship title under the leadership of their determined and incredibly intense coach, Monica. The athletic feats that these cheerleaders do is simply breathtaking. If you aren't familiar with competitive cheerleading, imagine this. Combine gymnastics with incredibly fast-paced dancing, and then add in people throwing and catching other human beings, all while wearing unbelievably sparkly costumes. It's pretty intense. Well, in order to do these incredible feats, the team has to train. Like many college athletes, most of the Navarro cheerleaders have been training for this opportunity their entire lives. Growing up, they spent their afternoons and their weekends in cheerleading gyms, learning to jump, tumble, and stunt. 
Many of them started training when they were only five or six years old. By the time they come together at Navarro, they already are phenomenal athletes, but they still have to practice even harder as a team. They do drills. They practice the components of their routine over and over and over again until it is in their bones. And they become a family. As a team, they're so in sync that they can trust each other completely to literally catch them when they fall. Let me tell you a secret. As hard as the athletic feats these cheerleaders accomplish are, it is even harder work to be a Christian. The goal that we have, being made whole, being recreated in the image of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, requires even more training and practice than it does to be a Navarro cheerleader. Just like athletes need to train in order to be great at their sports, we need to train to be Christians. We need exercises to train our spirits in the way of Jesus. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, had a name for these Christian training exercises. He called them the means of grace. His idea was basically this. Of course, there are millions and billions of ways that God interacts with us. God is never limited to work only in certain ways. But at the same time, there are certain practices that seem to be particularly effective. Church history and our personal experience suggests that God tends to show up in these time-honored traditions. The means of grace aren't magical. There's nothing in and of themselves that makes them effective, but they are the ordinary channels through which God moves in our lives. It's the power of God that makes it work and not our own merit. And yet, God wants us to be part of the process of our own sanctification. God's grace and our effort aren't opposed, but actually work perfectly together in cooperation. Wesley included in the means of grace things like reading, hearing, and meditating on scripture, praying alone or praying as a congregation, and receiving Holy Communion. If the means of grace are our training exercises, the church is the context of our training. I don't just mean that the church is where we train. The church is a people and a movement, not just a building. The Greek word that's translated as church is ekklesia, which literally means gathering. It has the same meaning as the Hebrew synagogue. Before the church is a building or an institution, it's a gathering together of God's people. We call this building the church because it's one of the primary places where the actual church gathers. In the same way for you who are online worshipers, YouTube is sort of your church because it's where you gather. Participating in the church is so much more than just what happens on Sunday mornings. And yet, Sunday morning worship is where some of our best training happens. Just think about it. Everything that happens when we gather together has a purpose for our training. We begin by opening ourselves up to the presence of God and choosing to worship. By worshiping, we assign worth. We say that God is worthy. We stand up together and we affirm our faith. We use these ancient words and by doing so, we reorient ourselves to the historic faith that our ancestors lived and died by. We read scripture, all over scripture, not just the passages we most like. And we hear people preach about it, try to explain it, try to see how it aligns with our lives. And we receive Holy Communion. 
we have the opportunity to hear once again of God's redeeming work, and we can even taste and touch these elements that become for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ. These are the training exercises that we do, but we need to do them with our team. Part of the reason I think I love the show Cheer so much is because I used to be a competitive cheerleader myself. Of course, I was nowhere near the skill displayed on the show, but I absolutely loved it, and I worked really, really hard at it. I stretched every day, I did balance exercises, I went to open gym sessions most weeks, and by doing those things, I really did gain skill, but it didn't necessarily make me a great cheerleader. You see, the more that I practiced, the more I began to resent some of my teammates. I felt like I was working harder than them. I didn't think they cared as much as me. I didn't think they were as committed as I was. I could see all the mistakes that they made in our routine. Sometimes I wished I wasn't even on a team at all. I wondered if they were the thing that was holding me back. I wished I could compete alone so that I alone could be held responsible if I lost and I alone could get the credit if I won. But here's the thing, cheerleading is a team sport. Doing it alone wasn't an option. So I could do all the training on my own that I wanted, but without my team, none of it mattered. In the same way, our individual works of piety only get us so far without the community of the church. Christianity is a team sport too. John Wesley famously said that there is no holiness but social holiness. In other words, you can't be holy by yourself. The means of grace, our training to be made whole, take place within the community of the church. Wesley even said that holy solitaries is a phrase no more consistent with the gospel than holy adulterers. Yikes! Being Christians alone isn't possible, but I can understand why we might often wish that it was. The problem with the church, you see, is that it's full of people. Messy, mistake-making, opinionated, annoying people. As one of my seminary professors once said, I love God. It's his friends I have a problem with. Being part of the church means being associated with people you disagree with and possibly even dislike. We hear terrible stories in the news about things that Christians have done, and we might want to distance ourselves from them. We hear about scandals and abuses of power within the institutional church, and we want absolutely nothing to do with it. Within the church, we can be tempted to believe that what we really need to do is just get back to some previous version of Christianity that was more problem-free and pure. So when exactly was it that all of our problems started? Maybe it was the Reformation, when all of these Protestants decided that we should break off and do our own thing. But even before that, the Eastern Orthodox Church had already disagreed so much with the Catholic Church that they split. And before that, there was argument after argument so much that people killed each other over the words of our creeds. So maybe then we need to go back to the Church of the New Testament. Well, have you ever taken a moment to look through these letters? Half at least of the New Testament is composed of letters written to try to solve problems of people disagreeing within congregations. And still we hold this up and say, this is the word of God for the people of God. 
There's no such thing as a pure, perfect church. For the past 2,000 years, we have pretty much been fighting constantly. There was never a per pure, perfect, conflict-free church. And that's okay. God doesn't need, to, need for the church to be perfect in order for it to be used. But what God does seem concerned with is that we stick together, that we practice the hard work of unity, even with all of our diversity. One of my favorite things about Wrightsville UMC is that I see in this congregation a desire to sit with the tension and disagreement and still remain together. I see people who are willing to try to assume the best in people who disagree with them politically or even on certain theological points. In our congregation, we have staunch Republicans and committed Democrats. We have widely different views on human sexuality that mirror the spectrum of beliefs across United Methodism. And yet, we are still together. We are still fighting to be with one another. In this congregation, I see a unity that comes not from being of one mind, but from being of one heart. We are part of a rich tradition of God's radical movement in the world. When we pray, when we sing songs of worship, claim Christ and look after the least among us, we stand in a long line of believers that includes Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King Jr., C.S. Lewis, Dorothy Day, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, John Wesley, Isaac Watts, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Constantine, Julian of Norwich, Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine, the Apostle Paul, the disciples. We are part of a community that also includes billions of believers whose names we may never know, who worshiped the Lord in simple daily acts of obedience throughout history. We stand with our ancestors, both biological and spiritual, who passed the faith down to us. I don't know about you, but that is a group I am proud to claim, even with all of the mess. At the end of the day, the question, why bother with the church, actually has a very simple answer. Because this is how God has chosen to save the world. God isn't saving the world through individuals armed with their personal Bibles who agree to just keep to themselves. God is saving the world through this gathering of messy, mixed up people who have been fighting since the very beginning. God is using the church in the same way that God usually works, by partnering with broken, fallible things, even partnering with us. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we thank you for the church. Our mother, the church, is not always easy to love. And yet this is where you have called us into being, where you have claimed us as your own, and where you are training us in the exercises of wholeness. Lord, make us willing to be united, to stay with each other in the messy, hard work of being together. And Lord, let us ultimately be collected into you with Jesus Christ as our head. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
friends, we are called to be the church. And some of the ways that we can do that are through events together, any opportunity that we have to gather as God's people. I have a few ways that I'd love to invite you to take part in the church in the coming weeks. The first is through a social event called Stirred Not Shaken, which is a gathering of young-ish adults between maybe 30s and 40s. This event is going to take place on February 3rd, that's a Thursday, at 6.30 p.m. at the venue at Wilmington Brewing Company. Um, I know that this is a partially outdoor space, and so it is going on with the, with the hope that this will be able to be safe in the midst of the current COVID situation that we're in. Second, there's a wonderful opportunity for service that has really just been brought to our attention, and that is participating in Wilmington's The Warming Shelter. This is a pop-up, as needed a shelter in downtown Wilmington anytime that the weather goes below 30 degrees. So we're looking for volunteers from our community who would be willing to support that ministry. There's lots of different ways that you can get involved and can serve. If you're interested in that, please go ahead and email me or Donna Hudson um, or see the information that was in your e-blast this week. Now, I invite you even to stand where you are as a reminder that it is time to go into the world. And as you go, may the spirit of the living God made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ, our Lord, go before you to show you the way, go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own, go above you to watch over you and protect you. Go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand. Go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace. Go now in peace. Go now in peace. May the love of God be with you everywhere, everywhere you may be.